themselves as they feel the world is with them. You know, and so in other words, Obama goes on YouTube because he thinks everybody wants to see him on YouTube. You know, and because he has that, because he's preoccupied with himself in that way, he feels the rest of the world must be as well. Now, this is something that's normal in adolescence. You know, adolescents need that kind of fable to survive. But when those things start to appear... Well, hold hold it. What do you mean by a fable? Repeat again what, an, what a fable, what you mean by a fable. Okay, so an adolescent fable, an adolescent thinks that the world is as preoccupied with them as they are with themselves. Now, that's part of their survival mechanism to get through adolescence. They don't have that More way, isn't it? More way. Let's go back before that, Doctor. An infant. An infant would be the ultimate narcissist, wouldn't they? Right. I mean, if they had insight. But, they, you know, they don't, it, you know, they're not, it's not something that they're doing from, I mean, we're, I think we're pretty much the only species that's born helpless anyway. And so, you know, what ends up happening is with an infant, I mean, they're not, they're, we're required to take care of them. And in adolescence, as, as a child starts to gain their independence and enter in the adult world, they're faced with problems that they don't necessarily have the skills to deal with. So anytime you see adolescent behavior in an adult, you start thinking right away, personality disorder. And now, the well, what, about in, what about infantile behavior in an adult? Let's go back. I mean, we know there's a lot of adults who behave like adolescents. That's something that's rather common. But what about adults who behave like infants, who are literally infantile in virtually everything they see and do? Put it to you this way: One good way to look at it to answer your question is that anytime somebody, an adult, is displaying childlike behavior, then you can start to look back at you know you you look at what developmental age they're displaying and what behavior they're displaying, and something at that time in their life stunted their growth, and so it's a regression back to that particular age. You know, it, it's wow. something prevented that that growth, and so it's normal for you, for example, to think that you are the greatest radio talk show host in the world, or else why would you be doing it? But if you feel that that's true, and you go home and say, well, because I'm the greatest, greatest radio talk show host in the world, that must mean I'm the greatest cook, the greatest baseball player, the greatest person to ever put gas in. <laughs> Wait a minute. So you tell me I'm not as crazy as I think? You know what Carl Jung said? Carl Jung said, show me a sane person and I'll cure him. You know, only the people, <laughs> only the people that think they're normal. Well, no, I'm, very, I'm very introspective, and I, I analyze myself a little too much. I have my whole life. But I started this conversation by saying let's not be so quick to, to accuse Obama of being a narcissist because anyone who achieves anything in our society, whether it be a surgeon, sports figure, and myself included, we all think that we're great or else we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So what you're saying is that kind of, let us say, self-pride is somewhat narcissistic but not what a pathological form of narcissism well check this out if you were going to have a major surgery like when i was going to school i worked in heart surgery for two decades and if, if you were going if you had to have heart surgery and you had your choice between a heart surgeon that thought he was the greatest heart surgeon in the world and charged you twenty thousand dollars for the surgery or a heart surgeon that thought he was pretty good and was charging you ten dollars where would you go i mean you don't you no, want I, I i would go to the most famous a uh, heart surgeon who had tremendous faith in himself or herself. No matter what it cost me, I'd go to the, I don't care how big their ego is, I want to know what the results are. That's a different story than Barack Obama, who thinks he is the greatest president, who's had terrible results, and is in denial about his results. Witness the stock market in light of what he said Tuesday, that the economy's booming. Witness what happened with the Iranian capture of our uh, sailors when he said it didn't even happen. And we have the greatest military in the world. So that's a little different, isn't it? That's sort of an unhealthy view of the world because it's a, a pathological form of narcissism? Yes, it's pathological. It's pathological because by the nature of his personality, his success is already determined. So it, 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 none of these... Ah, so in other words, a pathologically narcissistic individual doesn't even know reality. Isn't that what you're saying? And they don't have the insight to be redirected whatsoever. Like you and me, I mean, we can take criticism. I mean, I might, I might get upset about it. I might not like it. I might not want to hear it. I might act like a jerk, or I might have to figure it out a couple days later. But I mean, I can take a hit. You know what I'm saying? And that's, and, and I can be redirected because I'm getting bad results. If I get, a, if I do something and I don't get a result I like, I'm going to do something different the next time. But they don't operate mm. that way because their success is predetermined, and so no amount of insight is going to cause, cause them to redirect their behavior or redirect their thought process. Their, their success and their stature and their whatever is already predetermined. That is it's not shakable.
Oh, so let's look at the Republican candidates last night. The most narcissistic amongst them would be Donald Trump, correct? I agreed. But it doesn't mean that it's a pathological narcissism. It could be a healthy narcissism based upon his achievements, his accomplishments. I would say that that's a healthy narcissism, correct? Well, sure. I mean, from a, from a professional standpoint, there aren't a lot of degrees in personality. Um, so, no. like, for example, you know, he would, he would fall. I mean, I don't, I mean, obviously I don't know the man, but, I mean, he would fall on that spectrum. But I guarantee you that you can find areas in his life where he's either been redirected or taken advice. I mean, a narcissist isn't going to surround themselves with a bunch of good advisors. Look at Obama. But Donald Trump will get into office and surround himself with the best of the best to help him in decision making. That's not a narcissistic quality. Not on any level. Why, how do you how do you know Donald Trump would do that? What leads you to believe he would be different than any other man who has achieved the presidency based on uh, based upon his ego? Tell me what makes him different. He's done it up until this point with his business. He has a track record of surrounding himself with people who can get things done, with people who who make certain decisions and, and make good decisions. It's part. All right, and Obama surrounds himself with flunkies. I mean, in my, I shouldn't say that, but I mean, in my opinion, he surrounds himself with people who are as committed to the outcome as he is. In other words, well, Ronald Reagan was very much like that. Ronald Reagan said he surrounds himself. He finds he finds smart people to do the things that need to be done. And, you know, in other words, he can delegate a smart man, a smart leader can delegate authority. That's the differential between a really smart man and. And someone who simply wants to lord it over others, I would think, correct? That's perfect. And I'll even take I'll even take what you just said, which is killer, and I'll take it one step further. One of the biggest lessons I learned from the time that I served in the military was that you can delegate authority, but you cannot delegate responsibility. And that's the problem. And so you have somebody like Obama in the Obama administration, he surrounds himself with people who can't necessarily get things done, has a bad outcome, he's not gonna take responsibility for it if we're even lucky enough for him to consider it to be a bad outcome. He won't, you know what I'm saying? Because he thinks Absolutely. he can delegate authority and responsibility. That's a that's a trait of his. That's a trait of what appears to be his issue. I don't think I don't think Trump would fall into that category. But you know, how do I know? But he wouldn't achieve the success he's achieved in the way that he's achieved it if that was the case. Because you can, like well, I, right? He gets like, up on Tuesday at the State of the Union address and says that the sailors. He didn't even mention it, by the way. And then he said uh, that we have a great economy and we have the market collapsing. So, uh, okay, so he's disconnected from reality, goes on YouTube for adulation from people who he doesn't know for what reason. Is How does it differ from him going on YouTube from a politician doing public appearances uh, of any kind in a stadium? How does it differ? Because there's no threat. I mean, everything that he does is, is you know, he wants to be able to increase his exposure without increasing the threat to himself. It's just like anything. It's just like target shooting. I have a muscle. Oh, in other words, when Trump gives a speech at a rally, yeah, he can be criticized and throw the person out, but Obama is so insulated that no one can even criticize him ever, anywhere, under any circumstance. Because he can't, he can't think about his next move. See, Donald Trump knows enough. Donald, Donald Trump or, or any reasonable person or whatever who's achieved success knows that whatever, whatever course correction that is that they're faced with that they're going to be able to navigate it obama doesn't know that he can he has that this myopic tunnel vision of what he wants to accomplish with something and nothing can disturb or distract it because he's he knows that he's not going to be able to be redirected because of what i said to you before it's just like a giant naval ship i was on a ship for a while if you do a course correction in the ocean by one degree it's not a big deal for a little bit but the next thing you know you're in another hemisphere well and you know so i gave that about seven years ago i gave that exact story that one degree of separation from a true course doesn't seem like much when you make that alteration. However, far out, far from that point of uh, deflection, it becomes an enormous differential. And I said that's why a president who deflects the nation even by one degree, it doesn't seem like much in the beginning, but downstream it's enormous. And he's deflected us far more than one degree of separation from where we should be. And just, this might just take, take some comfort in this because uh, you're kind of one of my heroes. But, you know, I, I never heard you say that story. But just so you know, that is something I use with my clients on a daily basis, just so you know. Well, what do you mean? By telling them that although they've only gone off course by one degree, it's had enormous effects on their life? 
Exactly, and I'm able to use that analogy when they've had when they when they've either made a great stride in their work that they're doing from a psychological perspective, or when they've fallen backwards in a way that's going to cause them harm in the future. It's it's just a most nautical metaphors and 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 stuff I found very useful in my practice. It's just people so do I. I live by the water, and I learn a lot from the birds, and I learn a lot from the seals and the fish from the waves and the wind, and I learn a lot from the tides. I learn more than I do from reading about uh, uh, global warming from people in universities who don't even know what's going on down at the level of the bay. Jeremy, Dr. Jeremy, psychiatrist, psychologist extraordinaire on KLIF. Thanks for being with us. Hold on one quick second before I break. So I wake up this morning. I live near the water in San Francisco Bay. I hear a racket from the birds. I look out. There's thousands of them feeding on the rocks off my house. The herring are running, and it's something to watch. The poor birds were really at the end of the ropes the other day. You know, I normally throw them some bread in the morning. I could saw they were very hungry, and the rain came. I said, how the heck do these animals eat? It's going to get rainy now. What do they do? Where are these poor animals? Two days later, there's thousands of them feeding off the rocks because the herring came in, and they lay their eggs into the rocks. You can't believe it and how the birds get along. They don't peck each other. First come the big birds. The huge birds came in first, the pelicans, which I go crazy watching them. And then and then the smaller bird and the smaller bird and the smaller bird and then the seals back in a minute. For the last minute of the show, I gotta tell you, there's a major international story that I've not seen in the major press at all. Russia has gone around Israel and set up a joint command center with Jordan to achieve its objective of restoring the Assad regime control in South Syria. This is an enormous story. The Russian-Syrian military agreement is open-ended. It's powerful. And now Putin, by the way, Putin sees Syria as a client state, incidentally. And he wasn't going to let Syria fall into the hands of ISIS or, be, uh, or have his puppet leader, if you want to call Assad, that overthrown by Barack Obama or the West in any way. And as you well know, he moved in there to shore up uh, Assad. Well, now he did something else the other night which didn't make it to the news. And that is Russia set up a joint command center with Jordan. And now they can avoid Israel and achieve the Russian objective of restoring the Assad regime control in South Syria. I believe this is actually good news for Israel's survival, incidentally. Thanks for listening. Good night. Savage.